March is, of course, Women's History Month, a time to celebrate the accomplishments of extraordinary women and recognize those who are transforming the lives of others. Melinda Gates is doing just that through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has given away more than $54 billion over the past 20 years. Most recently, close to $2 billion of that has been earmarked for COVID. So much collateral damage from this virus. But she is now specifically focusing on what she calls a crisis in caregiving. If COVID-19 were a person, it would be a bigot. This virus has a penchant for discriminating by race, age, and gender. Well, it's created a crisis for women. Melinda Gates is pushing back on all fronts. We're seeing women leave the workforce in droves, even compared to men. And a lot of it has to do with the types of jobs women are in, but also the caregiving that women do for children and the elderly. According to the United Nations, the coronavirus pandemic has driven 47 million women out of the workforce. And what is the issue with the jobs that women tend to have? Why are they more impacted in times of crisis like this? Well, because women often have those jobs in hospitality or in the essential worker types of roles, but those are very fragile jobs in our economy. And so if you particularly are a low income woman and you have no one who can take care of your children, not a sister, not a grandmother, not a husband, wow, how can you go and get on the bus and keep your job? And then as well, as we know, we've lost a lot of service and hospitality jobs in this recession. The former general manager at Microsoft turned billionaire philanthropist and co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has spent decades and more than $54 billion fighting the various ailments of this planet from poverty to climate change and most recently COVID. The Gates Foundation to date has given about $1.75 billion, I believe, to the COVID response. This latest $250 million donation has been specifically earmarked to um, I uh, equality when it comes to making sure that everyone is able to get access to the vaccine. How specifically do we go about achieving that? Well, we make sure that the tools we know that work, the tests, the treatments, the vaccines, that they get out to all countries, not just high income countries in like the United States or in Europe. You know, think if you're an essential healthcare worker and you're working in a country in Africa and you're still going to your job in the healthcare sector, maybe you're delivering babies, but you have no access to a vaccine. That makes absolutely no sense as we're distributing them more widely, for instance, in the United States. And how does that impact us globally if uh, the least of these are not getting that same equity when it comes to vaccine distribution? Well, first of all, there's obviously the moral argument. It's the right thing to do that we protect all healthcare workers first and all vulnerable populations. But economically, we're going to have a much slower recovery in our own country. Travel's not going to go back to the way it was, whether it's leisure or business travel. You're not going to get our manufacturing and supply chains fully running. If you have these variants that are going to crop up more and more in these places that aren't vaccinated, and then that's going to bounce back into our own country, and we're going to continue to have ride this wave of this pandemic. Her husband, Bill Gates, recently shared with me that getting shots into developing countries will be the only way to end the pandemic. Well, there are many countries that have no vaccine factories at all, and it doesn't make any sense that their citizens wouldn't get any protection. After all, we want to end the disease everywhere so we're not constantly having these reinfections. And let's talk about vaccine equality closer to home. Of course, as you well know, uh, the COVID in general has disproportionately impacted black and brown communities, um, not just with suffering, but with death, and now with access to the vaccine. What do we do to change that? You take the vaccinations to their neighborhoods and set up a place there for them to come so they don't have to get on a bus or drive their car 30 miles across the city to go get access to vaccination. Gates says we could reach global herd immunity from COVID sometime next year, and many medical experts agree. You and your husband had a focus way before many others on the idea that a pandemic could hit. Is this what you 
expected, projected? Is it worse? We never imagined that, that country after country would go through these ripples of these lockdowns and the economic destruction that would happen. So I'd say we predicted some pieces of it, but we certainly didn't predict the scope and scale and magnitude of the economic devastation and the impact of that on families, not just the pandemic itself. The impact is especially hard on women. Women's jobs are nearly twice as vulnerable in a crisis than men's jobs. And you're now asking leaders to put women right in the center of the COVID-19 response. Why women in particular? When you look at all the jobs lost in the United States last year, 275,000 jobs were lost by women, 71,000 by men. And so this disproportionate effect, we could have a whole generation of women who leave the workforce, and then if we don't deal with the caregiving crisis we've got, they may never go back. I want to quote for a moment here. In the Washington Post, you wrote, the caregiving system in the United States is broken, and it is women who are paying the price. Uh, you went on to ask President and Biden to appoint a caregiving czar. Why? Because I think we need to coordinate our government's efforts across a number of agencies. But there are absolutely things this government can and should do to, one, make sure that the child care sector doesn't collapse, and number two, to make sure that we have the right long-term policies for paid family medical leave. What are the steps that you feel that world leaders need to take in order to lift women up? I feel like they need to look at caregiving in their country for sure. They need to look at the harassment and abuse in their country because that is one of the things that holds women back at home and in their job. And they need to look at investing in women-led businesses, whether that's a tech business or whether that's a woman's vegetable stand in a low-income country. Women have a harder time getting access to capital. And for decades now, you and your husband have really been putting your money where your mouth is and trying to solve uh, these global issues. And, and I'm curious, because you have this acute awareness and knowledge about what the big threats are, when you look at the next 10 years, the next 20 years going forward, are you optimistic or, or pessimistic about the future? I'm optimistic. I think if we use this opportunity coming out of the pandemic to very swiftly change some of the policies, like in the United States, paid family medical leave, you know, these gaps and cracks have been in society, these inequities, but now they're in our face. So if we build back in the right way with the right policies and we build back right now and we start with a surveillance system, we're going to have a better world where you're not going to get these pandemics that rush from country to country. We'll be able to contain them and control them more quickly um, where they are. And when it comes to if it's equality or pandemic or climate change, is there some kind of a global threat in particular that keeps you up at night? Is there something that you're acutely concerned about? I'm acutely concerned about whether global leaders will take this moment in gender equality and take it very, very seriously and realize that they need to make these investments now. But uh, it keeps me up at night. You know, are we going to use this pandemic for the better for on behalf of women so we build back in the right way? Or are we going to kind of just put some Band-Aids on it and then move forward and say, oh, we fixed it when we really didn't? And lastly, if, if your microphone right now were to be able to serve as a megaphone to world leaders, what would your message be directly to them? My message to them directly would be, women are the backbone of your society. They take care of your children. They take care of everybody else. When you invest in them, they invest in the entire community. And they lift up not just their family and the community, but they lift up your economy. You want them in the workforce. So you support them, and you're going to get the economic recovery and the returns that you want. In 2015, she launched Pivotal Ventures, a company focused on removing barriers for women in the United States. She is a global benefactor who for decades has affected change with money. Now she's also spending a different kind of currency, using her voice, calling for more female leaders. One of her goals for 2021 is that it will be a turning point for gender equality.
I think it's time for the world to have more female leaders in all positions of power because we know it makes a difference when a young girl or young boy can look up and say, I don't want to be like that leader, but wow, there's six other female leaders and I want to be like those six. You know, you can't be what you can't see. And I think female leadership makes an important, um, makes just important choices for society as a whole in a different way because of the way women see society. And having women and people of color in positions of power makes a difference for society. Our right, thanks to Melinda Gates for that conversation. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.